good. Um, and tonight's no exception. We're going to be learning about this man, Jotham. Yahweh is perfect is his name. He was indeed a great king or a king of great godly integrity. Uh, we don't know a great deal about the man apart from what you just read there in, uh, in 2 Chronicles 27. The correlating uh, record uh, in Kings doesn't give us a great deal more information about him at all. Uh, so it's a brief record but nonetheless an important one to, to look at so that we can hopefully gain some lessons from this, this relatively young man. Um, the sad thing about this man's life, and I'll say it right from the beginning, is this, that whilst he himself had a really fantastic personal relationship with his God, unfortunately it didn't rub off on the people around him. Uh, and sadly, uh, the record tells us, as we read there in verse 2, the last part of verse 2, the people yet did the people do corruptly. So they continued on in their bad, evil practices that they'd gotten themselves entrenched in, which is really a shame because uh, when you think about it, he was a man that was trying his best to, to lead by example and yet the brothers and sisters around him and the families around him really shunned it. And that's probably one of the things that would have really saddened this man in his life. Um, He's one of only five good kings out of the entire range of kings that we're presented with in, in the Chronicles and Kings records. It's, it's amazing, isn't it? It's just actually a talking point that we had in our last class um, that God provides so much information about all the kings of Israel and, and all the kings of Judah, in fact, it's 38 of them in total, that only five of them end up being good kings. And you, you start to scratch your head and think, well... Why was there only five good kings? But more importantly, the more you look at it, we're told more about the bad kings than what we are about the good kings. In fact, if you have a look at the whole range of all the kings, 70% of the record of the kings, of the book of kings, the book of the chronicles that cover all of the kings of Israel, and there were no good kings in Israel at all, and only five good ones in Judah, there's about 70% speaks about the bad kings. And only 30% about the five good kings. And you think, well, why, why is that? Why, do, why doesn't God just discard the bad kings and say he was a bad king, you don't want anything to do with him? Now let's look at the really good kings like Hezekiah and Josiah and Jotham. Let's really study what they did right. So it's an interesting thought, isn't it, brothers and sisters, as to why we're presented with some pretty atrocious characters in, in, in Scripture and how God really delves into their lives. Well, I don't pretend to, to know the answer to that, brethren and sisters. Um, I, I guess from my perspective, uh, we've just got this quote here, that all scripture is for our learning. Um, it's all there for our learning. There's, there's nothing in this book that we can't learn from. So the idea of God presenting us with good and bad kings and, and sometimes honing in on those bad kings, there, there is a reason for it. Now, I don't pretend to, as I said, know the exact answer to that except to say this, that I have my own inherent weaknesses just like you do. We've all done something wrong today. Might have to think about it, some of you, but I'm sure we've thought something wrong and we've done something wrong and if we haven't, we probably will by thinking to ourselves, well, I didn't do anything wrong, we've probably just already made a mistake and done something wrong. So we've, we've come here as weak, erring creatures, mortal creatures that often do think and say things that are inappropriate and are downright absolutely ugly in the sight of God at times. And whilst I can look and you can look and we can all come here and we can learn some great things from some great characters of Scripture, some wonderful characters of Scripture, inevitably we sometimes subconsciously think in our mind, well, I would never, ever be able to be that good. I could never get to the heights of this man, Jotham. I could never get to the heights of Hezekiah and Josiah. I could never get to the heights of those kings that were good, and there was only five of them. I could never get to the heights of, of say, Moses and, and other wonderful characters. I could never get there, even though it's great to see how elevated they were and, as far as a, the, the spiritual uh, way in which they lived their life. 
Nevertheless, when you hone in on some of the bad kings, instead of saying, well, I'm not that bad either, at least I don't do those things in my life, but if we look at those bad kings, those evil kings, and say, oh, if I'm not careful, I can head down the same track as those kings. And even though we might say, as we showed in our last class, that we don't get these little idols out and we worship, and we do in other ways in our life. So God's deliberately putting those characters in the Bible, brethren and sisters, so that we can learn from their mistakes, their bad experiences, and we can say, "Uh uh-oh, I'm heading down that track. I've got to pull myself in and rein myself in as best I can with God's help. So that's why we do have good kings to look at and we have a lot of bad kings to look at and we can combine them together and really try our best to to order our lives accordingly. So let's have a look at Jotham. He was an upright man, no doubt about that, and the chronology of of this man is is rather interesting, uh, even though it's very brief, and one of the sad things is, we'll get to it in a moment, is he wasn't on the scene for very long. He starts his reign at the age of 25 years, um, and he becomes co-regent with his father. His father was Uzziah, previous chapter to chapter 27 there and we all know about Uzziah, we did him previously on, a, on another night on the kings and, and Uzziah started out extremely well, a brilliant king, till the last 10 years of his life or about the 10th the year before he died he made a fundamental error and pride got hold of that man and he ended up thinking he could become a priest as well as being a king, a king priest if you like and usurp the authority of being a priest and of course God smote him with leprosy and he he lived out the last 10 years of his life stuck in a special house, in a separate house, not in the palace anymore, stuck out in the backyard, back of a field, absolutely covered in leprosy for 10 years and his son Jotham became what they call a co-regent reigner, that is a, a, a I'm not sure reign is probably the right word, but a co-regent ruler, that's probably the word I'm looking for, with, uh, with his father. Because Isaiah was still officially the king. But he couldn't go out and do any public events. He couldn't go out and fight any wars. He couldn't go out and cut ribbons on new buildings and do anything like that. He couldn't even go out in public. For ten years he couldn't do that. So his son did it in his stead. And that's why he was a, a co-ruler with his dad, for that first 10 years. Of course, when his dad uh, passed away, there were some things that that this man did. This this young man, he was still relatively young. I think he was fairly young for the young ones amongst us, believe me. You're still fairly young when you're 25 and when you're 30 and when you're 35 and when you're 40 and when you're 45. You're still pretty young to us oldies. Uh, But one of the first things he did was to repair some of the sections of the temple and and the city walls. And we'll have a look at that in just minor detail in a moment and, and try and capture really what he was trying to do and hopefully what he was doing in a physical way, he was really wanting to, to, it to rub off on the people in a, in a spiritual way. And, and, you know, I really think he tried his best, but it just didn't work. Um, he then fortified and strengthened the rest of Judah, and that was a lot. He learnt about that from his father. Isaiah did a lot of these things, so he did learn some good th- things from his father. He had war with the Ammonites, was victorious over them and for three years they paid him a really handsome amount of of, uh, money and and food and the Ammonites uh, paid that tribute um, yearly for for three years. So he had successes at home, he had successes out in the country amongst the other cities in Judah and he had successes amongst his enemies. So he was a very successful king a very successful king as far as that is concerned. As a result of him always doing things under the, uh, the auspices of, of God's being in control of his life, he was greatly blessed. He was blessed for his excellent attitude. He became a mighty king, a mighty man, a greatly beloved and respected man. But here's where it gets a bit sad, brethren and sisters and young people. He died at the age of 41. 16 years he ruled, 10 of those were with his father in the background. So realistically he, was only, he only got 6 years on his own. 6 years. He 
is finally given a, a very honourable burial uh, with the, the kings. And that's the question, isn't it, brethren and sisters, when, when we look at this idea of this young man showing so much promise and yet it's taken off the scene, suddenly, dramatically gone. Why does God remove good kings at a relatively young age? Not the first one. I mean, Josiah wasn't terribly old either when he was taken off the scene, one of the greatest kings Judah ever had. Why does that happen, brothers and sisters? What, what, what is the reasoning behind these questions that crop up every now and again? I love that quote. If we didn't have that quote in the Bible, brethren and sisters, we would have all sorts of difficulty because we would just go around in eternity trying to find the answers to why God does some of the things he does. And we tend to, we tend to go around in this perpetual circle, but why? What good was there in God making a decision to take Jotham off the scene? God's riches, wisdom and knowledge, the records tell us, is so deep that it's impossible to explain his decisions or to understand his ways. And we need to accept, brethren and sisters and young people, that God never makes life-changing decisions unless there's a brilliant reason to do it. And we might not ever know what that brilliant reason is this side of the kingdom. I'm pretty certain that uh, Jotham's mother if she was still alive would have thought to herself why would you take my son off the scene after only six years on his own why would you just take him off the scene and of all things let Ahaz his son come on the scene and totally and absolutely almost destroy everything that Jotham had put in place and that previous good kings had put in place. Why would you do that? His riches, his wisdom, his knowledge, brethren and sisters, are so deep that it's impossible to explain his decisions or to understand his ways, but they are perfect. Every decision God makes is 100% perfect. And we don't know those ways. You know, we're told, aren't we, in Scripture that we've got to know God. To know God and his Son is to know, is to, is to know salvation, is to get salvation. You know, this is life eternal. To know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom he sent. So we've got to know God. But in our finite capacity, this side of the kingdom, brethren and sisters, we can get to know God as he wants us to know him, but we will never really be able to, to know him fully until we are made immortal. And then everything will just open up with pure clarity as we see the true God that we are learning to love now and are learning to have this relationship with him through his word and through our interaction with each other, it will all be opened up and everything will be revealed to us. So, uh, you know, it's, it's really an interesting, it's an interesting concept, isn't it, as you go through the life of these kings, why God does what he does. Here's a, a king that's been on the, on the throne basically six years on his own. He's gone at the age of 41. Then we have Manasseh comes along. He's on the throne for 55 years. 53 of them. He's the most atrocious king you could ever imagine. He's the one that sawed Isaiah in half in the tree. So we, we understand from Josephus and the record in Hebrews tells us some were sawn asunder. Well, I can't find anywhere in the Bible anyone was sawn in half or sawn asunder, as that, what, as that means. But Josephus says, well, actually it was Isaiah because he, he fled from Manasseh and he, he hid inside a hollow tree and Manasseh came along and got his men to saw the tree in half and, and Isaiah died in a most horrible manner. This was Manasseh. God gave him 55 years to reign. His ways are past finding out, brothers and sisters. We don't know how God thinks except this. As we've said, his decisions are perfect. We, we see things through our own eyes, through our own mortality, through our own finite minds, and we can't fathom why God does what he does. What we do know is that all will be revealed to us in that wonderful kingdom age to come. 
Well, his mother's name was Jerusha. It's the only time she's mentioned in the Bible is in here, in uh, 2 Chronicles 27, in verse 1, and his mother's name being uh, uh, but Jerusha, meaning possessed. And all of a sudden you think, possessed, that sounds a bit ominous. What does that actually mean? Well, I'd like to suggest to you, and, and again, we can't prove this dogmatically, and, but from what we can see in the record here and the upbringing that, that um, Jotham had, I, I would like to suggest that she was possessed with God's righteousness. Um, it says in the record there that she was the daughter of Zadok. Now, it's not often, has happened before, but it's not that often that you ever see a, a mother in Scripture linked with her father's name. So perhaps uh, we've been told here that Zadok, meaning uh, the uh, meaning the the just, the just one. Uh, perhaps what we're being told here, brothers and sisters, is that she was a very just person. She was possessed, as it were, with God's righteousness. She did everything she could to bring up that boy in the way in which he should he should walk. And at the time when Jotham would have been born, and at the time of him growing up through his formative years, he had a very good mother, if our understanding is correct, of verse 1, and he had an exceptionally good father. Uzziah was a very good king to start with. So he had an exceptionally good upbringing. Doesn't always go well, does it? Because his son, Ahaz, Jotham's son, who would have also, I would imagine, had a pretty good upbringing for a while... Unfortunately, of course, um, he got to that very difficult age, the age of 16, Ahaz did, where his father was taken off the scene. And Ahaz, as we're going to see in our, God willing, in our next uh, study on the kings, uh, just fell apart and didn't end up going at the, his father's way. So his mother, Jerusha, I think, had a very positive role to play in bringing up, up uh, Jotham and... Um, and of course, uh, perhaps also his, his grandpa as well, uh, Zadok. And grandparents, as we've mentioned before, also have a, a wonderful role to play in helping bring up their, their grandchildren. We've mentioned his father was Uzziah, meaning strength of Yahweh. And I'm going to give you a little bit of a, a hint here, brethren and sisters, as to why I think Uzziah played an exceptionally good role, particularly in the upbringing of Uzziah, we probably already can, can see that that would have been a fact. But I reckon, as we're going to see a little bit later, Uzziah, I think, played a positive role whilst he was bound up in that horrible, horrible house there as a leper. I think he played a, a reasonably good role for the final years of his own life that he was trying to drum into to Jotham. We'll say something about that in a moment. So um, Uzzah and Jerusha, uh, they, they helped jo Jotham uh, on his way as a, as a young, young lad and of course as he grew up he took control of the throne when his dad went off the scene as it were at the age of 25 years old. Uh, it does say in verse 2, he did that which was right in the sight of Yahweh according to all that his father Uzziah did. But then it's very expressly mentioned, except he did not enter into the temple of the Lord. So it's quite important to notice that Jotham was not going to make the same mistake as his dad. And we'll say something about that in a moment. Now... Uh, there was something very sad as we said about Jotham's reign um, the people themselves were not affected by his wonderful example and, and I really think that personally upset him I, I honestly think that he was desperately trying to get people's minds and hearts to change um, in the king's record in verse 2 where it says uh, here or sorry in, in this record in verse 2 where it says the people did yet corruptly in the king's record it says because they continued to worship in the higher places so they were more interested still in their own strange gods, in their own easy pathway, as it were, um, and they weren't really interested in the truth. And we're talking of brothers and sisters here, brother and sister. We're talking of ecclesial members. The, the, the kingdom of Judah and really Israel were, if you want to put it in terms we can try and understand, Christadelphians. 
They were God's chosen people. They were brothers and sisters with their families. And here is a leader of the ecclesia trying desperately to change the hearts of the families in the truth so that they might at least follow his example. Sadly it didn't happen and as we said before it was actually going to take his grandson to make that change. Jotham's grandson was Hezekiah and it wasn't until his grandson came onto the scene that there was at long last a, a wholesale change of attitude in the ecclesia. So that was another couple of generations away before that was going to actually happen. The summary of Jotham's life is absolutely brilliant. Oh, I'd love to have a summary like this. This would be a great summary to have, a divine summary from God about our life, brethren and sisters. So Jotham grew powerful because he was determined to live as, the, as Yahweh, his God, wanted him to live. Now that's found in verse 6. I've read it out of another translation, but have a look at it. So Jotham became mighty because he prepared his ways before Yahweh, his God. He grew powerful because he was determined to live as the Lord his God wanted. Goodness me, I would love to have that as a divine summary about me. I know it's nothing like that. That's how marvellous this man was. I pose this question. How was it that in his life, when he came across these signs in his life, these these obvious signs, you've got choices to make and life's all about choices. How was it that Jotham was able to make more often than not a wise, good choice? Life is all about choices. You would have had choices today or over the past week or so. We all, everything is about a choice. We have a choice of what we eat. We have a choice of what we drink. We have a choice of what we're going to go and see. We have a choice of coming to the class tonight. We have a choice of you know, going to the meetings or staying home. It's all about choices. And then you can narrow it down between making a good choice or making a bad choice. This man here from verse 6 tells me that he constantly, constantly made good choices, brethren and sisters. He made really good choices. I want to know the secret of that. What, what was it that helped him make good choices? Well, this is where I reckon his dad came into them. Now, I'm going to tell you something that is personal. It's a personal belief. Um, it's not something I can prove from Scripture. But I just try to imagine what it would have been like to be a co-ruler with my dad who's stuck out there in a house and he's just, got, he's just riddled with leprosy. I want to know what effect that would have on me and how I would rule over the, the kingdom. So you imagine this. Officially, for the first ten years that Jotham is the king, his father really is the official king, but Jotham is, is doing all the, the bidding of his father. He's a co-ruler, as we've said. Now, he would have to come fairly often to see his dad. Not many people would have. Under the law, you've got to be very careful how close you get to a leper. You dare not touch a leper or you become unclean. So this man, Uzziah, yes, he, he brought it upon himself because of a bad choice that he made, was banished to this very special separate house where he spent the last ten years of his life in abject misery. But at least he had his son who was ruling on his behalf as well, a co-ruler, who would often have to come and talk with his dad and talk about things that needed to be done in the kingdom. And I can imagine as maybe every day or at least a few times a week, Jotham would have to put a mask around his face. He'd have to trundle off down to this house wherever it was. And as he got closer and closer and closer to this house, the smell, the stench would be... St leprous people smell. They, they have a stench of death about them. They have rotting flesh. And as he got close to the house, the smell would be strong. And he'd know that I've got to go and see my dad. I've got to, he never gave up on his dad. He was a co-ruler with him. And he'd open up that door and there's his dad sitting in the chair. 
bandages all over his face because that's where the leprosy started. He's got oozing sores on his forehead and his face. He's possibly got fingers missing because it spread to his limbs, to his feet, to his hands. He's got fingers and toes missing. He smells horrible and he's stuck in this horrible house and he's got to sit on one side of the room. His dad sits on the other side of the room and every time he looks at his dad, his dad would say, this is a result of a bad choice that I made. Don't make the same mistake. And Jotham would get up and he'd go out and he'd do something positive. As the word tells us there in verse 3, he'd build up the high gate, the house, the wall of Ophel, which we'll see in a moment what else he did there and what it really meant, what he was trying to get through the people. Then he'd come back in, I've got to go and see Dad again, I've got to go and see him, and he'd come in there, and the same old thing, and he'd get in there, and his dad would say, see this? This is a result of me making a bad choice in my life. Don't make the same mistake. And I believe, brothers and sisters, Isaiah would have drummed that into his son time and time and time again. And in the end he didn't need to say anything because Jotham accepted the fact and knew the fact my dad's like that because of a bad, terrible choice that he made. The soft part of me likes to think that Isaiah might, might just perhaps be in the kingdom. We'll leave that up to the great judge of all to, to find out whether that happens. But who knows in that last ten years whether or not he took that active role of trying to tell his son don't make the same mistakes. You've got your whole life ahead of you, even though it wasn't going to be terribly long. You've, you've got to work out which direction you're going to go. So we've got good choices, we've got bad choices. You know, brothers and sisters, there is a choice we don't have in life. Um, the choice we don't have is we don't get a choice of how and when we're going to die. We don't have that choice. But we do have a choice of how we're going to live. And Joseph, uh, uh, Jotham was reminded every time he saw his father that I don't want to make the same decision he made in life. I'm going to make a good choice every time it confronts me. And he did. And he desperately wanted that to rub off on the people. Unfortunately it didn't. But I think, brethren and sisters, his, his father really was the epitome of, of Jotham learning a valuable lesson. Not only did his father and his mother bring him up right, but when his father went off the rails through pride and arrogancy, which is exactly what it was, even that last ten years, every time Jotham saw his dad, he still got a lesson out of it. And we can get lessons from people that make mistakes. We can. We, we all make mistakes. Some of them in Christadelphia are made so public. We're pretty good at doing that as a community. If someone falls over, we are very quick to highlight that and spread it through the social network like wildfire. It just goes and bounds. And we're all guilty of it. Oh, have you heard such and such and what he, he'd done and she's done and they've done. It's terrible, isn't it? You know, we're gossipers and we, we're quite happy to, to make sure that everybody knows some of the bad things that goes on in people's lives and some of the mistakes they make. But if we, if we don't learn from those mistakes, brethren and sisters, that others have made and that we make ourselves then it's pointless, it's fruitless. God wants us to learn from the mistakes of others and from our own mistakes. They are the experiences of life and we've got to do that. So the record tells us, brethren and sisters, that Jotham became mighty because he prepared his ways before Yahweh his God. Uh, you drill down into these individual words and the word prepared there means to order. It's to channel it's to make sure, it's to fix, it's to, it's to ensure that your ways are channelled in a certain direction. So the Proverbs tell us, keep thy heart with all diligence for out of it, out of it are the issues of life. It's not talking about our literal heart, the heart being the mind. Guard it, protect it, prepare it, try and channel it, force it, you've got to force it because we're all prone to want to go this direction. God's over there and we're prone to want to walk in that direction. We're not, we're not prone to walk in the direction of God. None of us are. 
The only person that was was the Lord Jesus Christ. We're all prone and biased to going in the opposite direction. We've got to channel, we've got to order, we've got to make sure, we've got to fix, we've got to somehow get hold of that mind and twist it around and look to the good that God has set before us. That's not easy. That's hard. I find that hard every day. You find it hard every day. It's not an easy task to do that. But God just wants to see us trying to do it. He doesn't want to see us abandoning ourselves consistently to go in the wrong direction. He wants to see us pulling ourselves up, trying to turn around and head in the other direction. Of course we're going to fall over. Every time we fall over, pick ourselves up, dust ourselves down and try to get on the right direction again. That's what God wants to see. That's what this man was doing. Every time a choice confronted him, he did his best to make a, a, a right choice. Of course he would have made mistakes. doesn't tell us of any mistakes, by the way. But he would have made mistakes. All, every, all, all the five king, good kings made mistakes. He prepared his ways. The ways it, it means a well-trodden path. A path really of conversation and behaviour. Be holy in all aspects of your life, says First Peter. And this is, he did it because of his God. And I really find that quite personal. We're not just talking about the God of the Bible. We're not just talking about Israel's God. We're not just talking about the God of the Ecclesia. It's because of his God. It's a personal thing. He did it because he wanted to, to walk before Yahweh, his God. Not someone else's. His own personal God. He developed such a strong personal relationship with his God that he could really reach out and say you are my God you're my father and cling on to his hand as he walked through that, that uh, uh, circumstances of life in a very very difficult time in Israel's in, in Judah's history so uh, there you have it brethren and sisters he, he became a mighty man he, he prepared his ways before Yahweh his God and I think his father had a lot to do with that, particularly in the former years. So Joth Jotham uh, put it from God's uh, word. He grew powerful because he was determined to live as the Lord his God wanted to him. Where did he get that attitude from originally? Well, just turn back a page because it's his dad. His dad again. His father. Second Chronicles 26 verse 5. Here's Isaiah's motto in life up until he, uh, pride took hold of him. And he, this is Isaiah, sought God in the days of Zechariah who had understanding in the visions of God and as long as he sought Yahweh, God made him prosper. And he was always reaching out to his God. He was reaching out. That's the idea of the, the, the seeking there. He was seeking God all the time. And every time he did, he was made to prosper. Sadly, of course, as we know, he did... He did fail to do that in the last part of his life, but his, his dad really did help him and assist him. And, and I think it's time we talk about dads for a moment or two. A few dads I can see in the audience here. Um, don't ever underestimate the example that you show your children. Fathers, and I know we've spoken about mothers before, so I'm not leaving you mothers out of it. We've already spoken about mothers in the past. But dads, you have a very, very responsible role to show your kids the right example. And I know I've been guilty in the past of doing exactly the opposite and you really can't often repair those breaches in life when your kids see you do something wrong and you almost can see it on their face that they look at you and think, I wouldn't have thought you would have done that, Dad. And, and sometimes you, you've got to be very cognizant of the fact that we're not going to be perfect but we've got to try our best to lead by example and, and try to put forward the good things that we should be doing in our life to our own children. And dads are certainly do play an extremely important role in that regard. As this comment here, one father is more than a hundred schoolmasters. Dads, you are better than any of the teachers at Heritage. They might teach your kids how to do maths and stuff, something I could never teach my kids because I was hopeless at maths. Uh, but nonetheless, in everyday experiences and in the right direction in which kids should be following, 
you're better than a hundred teachers. You really, truly are because your kids look up to you as fathers. They respect you. You're their hero. They love you and as you go through life and you get to a certain stage in your life and they get to a certain age in life, you just hope that you've done enough that they'll grasp hold and remember the things that you've, you've tried to teach them in the past. I can remember my dad, um, most of you wouldn't know my dad, he died in 1981 so it's a long time ago, I was only 23 years old when dad died and uh, I, I look back now and I, I can see the times where dad tried to correct me and, <laughs> and, and did in many ways, uh, quite often physically with a hand over the back of the head. And, I can, I can vividly remember getting chastised by Dad, but I can also remember him doing really good things with me and trying his best. And I was number four in line, so I'm down, I'm the, you know, the, the runt of the litter, you know, who cares about the last one on the end? But he was, he was really wanting to, to try and do the right thing and we'd go fishing together and we'd do all sorts of things and I really respected Dad for that. But I, as I said, I was only 23 when Dad died and Ever since then, it's been up to my mum, who, by the way, is probably listening on the iPad, to try and keep me in line, and she struggles to do that. But um, your parents never give up on you. They always are trying their best to, to lead by example. Um, I can remember Dad telling me once, he said, look, I'll just leave you with something. These are things that you always remember, and you can all remember things from your own parents, I'm sure, that what they've tried to teach you in life. And... This is well before emails and computers and anything. It was back in the days of letter writing. Do you know what that is, you young people? It's letter writing, it's a pen and a piece of paper and you write letters. It's none of this emailing business. And he said to me, he said, look, I'll tell you something. He said, uh, there'll be coming times in your life where you will be so upset with people for whatever reason. You might have a good reason to be upset with someone, whether it's in the meeting or even in the world, through business or through the, in the truth, you, you can get so upset at somebody. And he said, what you'll do is you'll get a pen out and a paper and you'll write them a letter. And you'll write that letter and you will express all your feelings about what you want them to know about how you've been treated and, you know, this is not right. And you will write it down and you'll sign. He said, when you've written the letter, and that's fine. He said, write the letter. And he said, then put it in the drawer for two or three days. Don't post it, whatever you do. Put it in the drawer two or three days. Then come back get that letter out and read it again and he said, I'll guarantee you, you will not send it in that form. And it's stuck in my mind for a long time and of course now we've got emails. It's dangerous, so dangerous. Because you type this email, no, 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 no. You know, it's not a matter of putting an envelope, putting a stamp on it, putting it in a drawer for a few days. You are so close, so close to hitting that send button and once you've done that, it's gone out into all the world. And so many people's lives have been ruined because of emails of people that have sent them out as a result of instant you know, temper that you've got and you just want to let people know how you feel. That was just one of the things I remember Dad telling me. It's nothing to do with Jotham, of course, but it was just something I had to share with you because that's something that's always gone with me throughout my life and I just find that and a great piece of information Dad gave me. Some of you might find that was pretty... Is that the only thing you ever got from Dad? No, I did know how to catch whiting as well. He taught me that, which was good. So, um, fathers, you do have a very important role as far as bringing out the children. I like this little saying. One night a father overheard his son's prayer. Dear God, please make me the kind of man my dad is. Later that night the father prayed, Dear God, please make me into the man my son wants me to be. Because while on this outward show we might be a hero to our kids, inwardly we know we're not doing the right thing all the time. We just don't want our kids to see that. We want to be better fathers and, and be a good example uh, to, our, to our kids. All right, very quickly as we round up tonight, what did he do? What did he achieve in his life? Well, it tells us in verse, uh, verse 3, he built the high gate uh, of the house of, of uh, Yahweh and on the wall of Ophel he built much. Um, just to put you in the picture what, what that is, uh, that's not necessarily the section of the wall that he built, it's just a picture of, of Jerusalem walls, but um, what I think uh, Jotham was trying to do here was obviously trying to protect 
the city first of all from the enemy. Of course the real enemy was inside the walls. It was the hearts of the people themselves. And, and sadly jo uh, Jotham really couldn't get that. He couldn't get that change, that attitude change. They kept continuing on in their bad ways. And, and when you have a look at what he actually did, there's a picture of the city of Jerusalem. What, what Jotham actually did was he, he built the high gate of the temple and at the same time he built on the wall of Ophel he built much. Now what he is actually doing here brothers and sisters were two things. He was trying to tell people in a, in a physical demonstration and these areas obviously needed attention but you've got the areas of, of family, you've got your family, your everyday life. He said you've got to build up the walls, a bit like Nehemiah and building up the walls of Jerusalem. You've got to build up the walls of your family and you've got to build up the walls of the ecclesia. There's two things he was doing here, brothers and sisters. He, he, he was wanting to protect the families. So when we leave this hall, we want to make our homes a safe haven for the truth. And when we come into this hall, we want to make this a safe haven for the truth. And that's what he was doing in a physical sense here, brothers and sisters. I'm building up the walls out there. That's what you've got to do in your families. You've got to build up the walls of faith in your families. And I'm going to build up the wall of the temple because the ecclesia has to be strong and vibrant. And it starts with what goes on in the home. And what goes on at the home will invariably affect what goes on in the ecclesia, brothers and sisters. And so we need to be aware of that. And that's what Jotham was trying to teach the people. He was desperately trying to teach the people, brothers and sisters, that you need to build up your faith in your own lives and the truth in, within the ecclesia. And sadly, it just wasn't working. It wasn't working. He went out of his way... Um, to uh, build fortresses and, and towers out in the outlying areas of, of Judah. He built cities in the hills of Judah and he built forts and he built towers in the wooded areas. Now a fort of course uh, is designed to uh, protect. A tower is designed to be watch, watch, uh, a watching tower or to be, have the idea of watchfulness about it so that someone up in the tower can see the enemy coming. So they can all get inside the fortress walls. The idea, of course, is strengthening and being watchful. And that's really what our life and the truth is all about today. Um, the idea of being watchful and strengthen the things that would remain. Not tear them down, not water them down, but be, be watchful, looking out for what's going on and, and, and strengthen the things that remain. And that's what we've got to do. We've got to do that. And in particular with our doctrines. Our doctrines cannot be watered down. We've got issues going on in this country right now with, with theistic evolution. And, and it's still going on and it's still raising its head and it's capturing a lot of imagination of our young people. They're starting to think, oh, I might look into that. We've got to address that, brothers and sisters, and we've got to strengthen our understanding of the truth, not, not water it down with things like that. And we've got to be on guard and watch out for any of these types of attacks that come our way. And they'll continue on, I think, this side of Christ's return. We've got to be aware of that. And this, that's what Jotham was doing in a practical sense. And, of course, we can see it in a, in a spiritual sense as well. Uh, we're not going to deal with verse 5. He, he did take on the Ammonites, the, the, uh, the, the enemy of Israel for donkey's years. They were always in the background causing issues to, Israel, to Judah and Israel. And of course he took them on, he overcame them and was paid a very handsome tribute for the next three years. Uh, as we saw in verse 6, he became mighty because he prepared his ways before Yahweh's God and then suddenly he's gone. We don't even know how he died. He's just gone. The rest of the acts of Jotham and all his wars and his ways, are they not written in the book of the Kings? He was 25 when he began to reign. He reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. Six years really of those were when he was on his own and then he's dead. He's finished. He's gone at the age of 41. Joseph slept with his fathers and they buried him in the city of David. Many of the kings are not buried. In, his own father wasn't buried in the cities of, 
of David, probably because of the, the leprosy he had. He was just buried in a field which belonged to the kings. He was not buried in, a, in the city. Many of the bad kings, they wouldn't have a bar of ever giving him an honourable funeral. But this man was given an honourable funeral, brothers and sisters. And I, I, I just can't help but look at this quotation here about how close he was to his own personal God. Isaiah tells us, This is the one to whom I will look. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. And I reckon that's another great summary of this man. We don't know any more about him. That's all we're told is those very few verses there in chapter 27. Nothing more. It's like a, 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 a meteorite just flashing in, doing what he had to do. God takes him off the scene and that's it. And he's indelibly listed now as one of the five good kings in Judah's history and his record's there for you and me to learn from it. And he's one of those good kings we can learn from it, particularly when it comes to making choices. He had, every day of his life, his own father that he looked at for the, not all of his life, but at least up until the last six years of his life, every time he looked at his dad, and particularly when his dad had that leprosy, he could see, I don't want to go down that track. I don't want to go down that track track well brethren and sisters the sad thing about Jotham was that lurking in the background was a teenage boy getting to a rebellious stage getting to be rather difficult getting to be uh, rather um, cantankerous if I could use that term and becoming quite a nightmare for his mum and dad to try and deal with maybe that's why Jotham was taken off the scene at an early stage because God willing in our next study we're going to deal with I think the worst king that we've ever done so far we've done some pretty nasty kings Ahab being one of them um, and a few of the others that we've done but this man here is incredible what he gets up to he was a two-faced, cruel traitor that belies, really, what he got up to. You, you just cannot even begin to imagine what he, he did. And again, I know it's a bad king that we're going to be dealing with, but there's some amazing lessons to be taught and learnt out of this man. So, God willing, in our next class, we'll be dealing with, with Ahaz and... Uh, and just uh, hopefully again continue to learn some lessons from that, these kings of Judah and Israel. <laughs>